start this live stream off taking a look at what Anna von Reitz or Reitzinger says about quantum grammar just to start off until we get some more people here I don't really need to share my screen because I can't do that here on YouTube but I'm just going to read some of it I don't know if any of you are familiar with Anna von Reitz. Matter of fact, why don't I just see what the internet says about her, and then I can share it with you. Judge Anna von Reitz, Alaska Supreme Court judge. What? Oh, I guess she's probably a Supreme Court judge the same way that Russell J. Gould's a Supreme Court judge. Anyways, she's um, an individual that does a enormous amount of writing. And... Uh, some of you may be familiar. You can look her up. In any case, what Anna says about contracts and quantum grammar. Anna says all contracts created men, by men are bull. It's all hokum and fraud. We aren't competent to guarantee what we will be doing at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, much less 30 years from now when we are supposed to pay off a mortgage. That is the fact of the matter, and that means that nothing we promise has to do nothing we promise to do has any binding force or true validity. It doesn't matter what language you use or if it is grammatically correct or not. People have no control of their circumstance or lifespan or any of the many, many contributing factors that go into whether or not a contract, even a contract made in good faith, can or will be kept. Now. That's quite a mouthful right there. Interesting that in the first paragraph of what Anna von Reitz says about quantum grammar, one thing she doesn't say is that quantum grammar is bull or hokum or fraud. She says it doesn't matter whether you use correct grammar or not. The contracts in and of themselves are fraud. That no one making a contract is competent enough to actually create a contract. Now that statement, in my mind, is pretty convenient. It sounds like Anna has created in her own construct, in her own mind, in her own biosphere, an out, a plan B. A back door. So she doesn't have to honor the contracts she makes or agrees to. Now, I'm going to go into something that's been a huge, had a big, uh, a huge impact on my life. And that is the fourth way of G.I. Gurdjieff, an esoteric teacher that taught the fourth way in the late 1800s through the 1900s until he passed away in, I think, 1949. Uh, you see, in Eastern philosophy and things like that, there are three well-known ways of reaching enlightenment or getting to know oneself. 
There's the way of the yogi, the way of the fakir, and the way of the monk. Gurdjieff taught the fourth way, which combines the first three ways. And the difference is you can do it right where you are right now. You can start doing the fourth way if you have the knowledge to begin. Whereas the other three ways, the monk, the fakir, and the yogi, require that you leave society and go up on a mountain or something and isolate yourself in a temple or something and uh, and study or do whatever you do to reach enlightenment through those ways. Uh, I believe the, the way of the yogi um, is you reach enlightenment through the intellect. The way of the fakir, you reach enlightenment through extreme physicality. And the way of the monk, you reach enlightenment through your emotional center. The fourth way combines these things. Uh, and Gurdjieff said that you know most of the people walking around today, today meaning back when he was alive, and I think it's still true today, are automatons reaction machines they can't very find it very hard to keep a promise or to keep a schedule or to honor a contract because they have so many what Gurdjieff called eyes in their head like you have one personality that comes out today right now and then you stub your toe and then another personality comes out and then that personality agrees to something and then another personality drinks a cup of coffee and then someone else comes out and they decide they don't want to keep the contract that the other guy that stubbed his toe made and you see what i'm saying it's like a multiple personalities within one body and gurdjieff the fourth way uh, teaches how to bring the master home meaning he likens the human psyche and construct into like a house where you have all these rooms and then you have the master bedroom and they're the map but the master is not home and so you have all these servants running around the house with no direction and they're just mucking the place up so the first order of business is to find someone who can basically be a manager of these people of these personalities that can kind of corral them and get them to go in a positive direction to prepare the house for when the master comes home, i.e. the will. And once that happens, once you reach enlightenment and you find your will and you crystallize a positive center of being, then you can make contract. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. So what I'm seeing, which he's writing here, is uh, it's a pretty interesting premise. And it's pretty actually, it's pretty convenient for someone who doesn't want to keep their contracts or honor their contracts. Everything is contract. Everything. And so if everything is contract, by her saying that all contracts are fraud and, and a man, a con there are no competent men able to create contract. Well, that's pretty darn convenient, don't you think? So let's continue on here. Ever tried to enforce a contract against someone truly down on their luck? Do the words blood out of a turnip have meaning for you? Just from that sentence alone, I can see that Anna perhaps is not familiar with the principles of the balance of the honor and the grace, the position of peace and neutrality, and the maintenance of rule one, rule equal. Why would anyone do that? Why would anyone want to force someone down on their luck to do anything like that? For example, if, if you are well off, you know, you, you have a good amount of value in your life. You have a nice home, 
vehicles. You're very comfortable. You have money to spare, so to speak. And then I come along and I don't have a home. I don't have a car. I don't have anything. I just lost everything for whatever reason. Maybe I'm a veteran that came back from overseas, had some very traumatic experiences in war, which messed me up in the head. And I've gone to my government for help, but they, they don't want nothing to do with me. They're not going to help me. They make me go through all these bureaucratic uh, hoops, which I don't understand because I serve my country. And I don't understand why they're making it so hard for me to come back here and live in peace. So I'm homeless because I have no help. But I know you, and I know that you have a little bit extra to give if someone needs it. So I ask you, hey, you know, do you think you could help me out? You think you could lend me 5K? So I can at least get a start, maybe get an apartment or something, and uh, maybe get a little beater car and so I can get a job and get to working back. So you can lend it to me, and then you say, sure, I'll lend that to you, but I'm going to need you to pay it back in two months. And in my head, I'm thinking, how am I going to get five grand in two months if I don't have two sticks to rub together right now? But I really want the money, and I really would like to get off the streets. So I agree to it. Two months rolls along. I have an apartment. I have a car. I have a job. But I don't have an extra five grand to give back to you. What are you going to do? It's your fault in the first place that you would even do such a thing. But this is what she's talking about. You see what I'm saying? So with the balance of the honor and the grace, you having lent me the money, me agreeing to pay it back uh, because I have no other alternative. I accept your money. I accept your terms, but I can't honor the contract. I'm sorry. And then you, with the balance of the honor and the grace, say, you know what? Don't worry about it. That was my gift to you. Just seeing you get on your feet and do better for yourself is worth any type of payback that you could ever give me. Don't worry about the 5K, bro. You do you. Now, that's the correct way for the situation to end up. Am I right? Anyways, that's what she's talking about. Therefore, all contracts made by men and even by our institutions, governments, corporations, etc., are rendered ridiculous and void the moment they are signed. If that is not obvious to everyone on this planet by now, it surely should be. All that a contract can be and all that it can represent is a good faith intention. That's why a loan is not the same thing as a debt and why the moral obligation to keep your promises, if at all possible, matters. Well, that's kind of what a contract is. Well, certain kinds of contracts... Anna uh, goes on to say, now, if it makes sense to you that Russell Gould somehow rules the world through the post office and that this is because certain keyholes and gates at the Vatican no longer line up the constellations the way they used to, you don't need me. <laughs> oh, man. No cap. That was that was funny. That's a good one, Anna. That's some hilarious stuff. You need a psychologist. Oh, wow. All right. So you see, folks, people like this, that write like this and speak like this, it's a total red flag for me because it is so condescending. Do you see that? Do you see the condescension in these words? Can you feel it? They're so condescending, like they think or, or they imply 
that they're more knowledgeable than you. And that if you don't agree with them, well, you're stupid. If you can't see things the way they see things, well, you're dumb. You're behind the curve, buddy. People like this, as uh, what is it Peter Griffin says, they grind my gears. I don't think these guys, Russell Gould and David Wynn Miller, mean anything but good toward the world. But the fact is, they have gone down the rabbit hole and learned to think like most of the Pope's advisors. And that is a real problem because good intentions are no fit replacement for reality and a dictatorship based on one man that was bad before is unlikely to be any better just because you changed the man in charge. A dictatorship based on one man that was bad before. That sentence makes absolutely no sense to me, but okay. I have the same problem with Franco Collins. He apparently means well, but he was a Jesuit and he learned to think like a Jesuit and can't break out of the mold. He's still stuck. Franco Collins. Wow, I haven't heard that name in a long time. Does anybody in the chat know who Frank Collins is? Have you ever heard of Frank Collins? Is it Frank O. Collins? Yeah, Frank O. Collins. I remember listening to a bunch of seminars from that guy. And I mean, aside from some interesting patriotic positions that he took, he really shared some good knowledge out there, but he he seems to have disappeared from the from the limelight. He is still creating his version of the same bad old template platter, pattern, making the same assumptions, and therefore recreating the same problems he is trying to escape. And what does that get us? More of the same insanity. Well, not really, Anna, because I don't think anyone's really ever heard of Franco Collins. <laughs> Let me hop up and down on one leg, substitute numbers for letters to make a new code language, start writing mathematically correct grammar rules, and declare myself queen of the world and see how many people buy into that. There's a reason people won't believe it. Oh, okay. So now, now she's going into the making fun of her perception of what quantum grammar is. Substitute numbers for letters. Yeah, she has no clue what she's talking about here, does she? The entire rationale of the claim made by the Holy See back in 1302 was flawed to begin with. And in responding to such a claim with new counterclaims, all you do is build fraud upon fraud. You unavoidably bring forth a new fraud that is the derivative of the old fraud. Rabbits give birth to rabbits. No. You'll learn something new every day. Thus, the unity states of our world trust becomes unum sanctum 2.0. Whatever, bro. If you believe and give credence to the Bible at all, you have to admit that no man can breach the covenants of God, and you have to realize that Pope Boniface VIII overreached himself and trespassed against two divine trusts that were not his to breach when he created the Unum Sanctum Trust. Folks, Anna just said at the beginning, right from the get-go, that all contracts are fraud. So how can you violate a fraud? A fraud is already a violation. So contracts are null and void. So why is she giving validity to the Bible? <laughs> Why is she giving validity to divine trusts? The Adamic trust and the Abrahamic trust owed to all people descended from Adam and Eve and to all the sons of Abraham respectively were breached by Boniface's actions. Well, no, no, they weren't because all contracts are bull, Anna. So why are you even talking about that? See, right here, she's directly contradicting what she said at the beginning. So this tells me, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, that the fraud isn't in the, not only in the contracts, 
but I, I would direct that uh, particular title or label towards the author of these words, just based upon that dichotomy right there. For fellows that advocate the adoption of mathematically correct grammar, neither Russell nor David appear to grasp the fact that if you start out with a breach of trust, you end up with a breach of trust. Well, that's this common logic. Similarly, replacing the current legal jargon, which is aptly described as legalese, with quantum grammar does not appear to be a net game because numbers can be manipulated and redefined as readily as letters. Now see, right there, right there tells me she knows exactly less than jack shit about correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar. She literally knows nothing about it just by that statement right there. However, I do agree with what she's implying here, what she's, what she's getting to. I do agree with what she's getting to. To try and construct valid contracts would just be doomed to failure for the natural causes already cited and would even less understandable for average people who would have to hire experts and then depend upon those experts to enforce and interpret and judge every aspect of any such agreements. Okay, so she's, again, she's not attacking the grammar itself. She's not saying that the grammar is hokum or or bull she's not saying that at all what she's saying is that taking quantum grammar and plugging it into the system that's already here and replacing legalese is not a good idea and and i agree i agree totally with that i agree that's ridiculous why would you want to build on a system that was built from a rotten foundation but no, you wouldn't have to hire experts because, folks, average people can learn this. Like, Anna is really putting some assumption presumption onto these average people. Anyone can learn this grammar. You just have to want to learn it. And if you're too lazy to learn it or you just don't want to, then I guess you can hire someone who knows the grammar to, to help you. But as I've been saying for six years, it's best to just learn it yourself. So you don't have to do anything like that. That would give those experts ultimate power over the outcome of all disagreements and the corrupting effect of such power is already known. That is complete fantasy land BS. Sort of reminds me of what Sar uh, Sergeant Robert Horton, Robert Horton was saying in the first War Castles video when he was trying to convey his concern that quantum grammar would fall into the bad guy's hands, which is a load of crap. Folks, correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar simply cannot be used for malicious means. It just can't be. It won't work. You have to be correct in order to be successful with it. You have to have closure on it, and you have to follow the principles, the three principles that I repeat ad nauseum. Balance of the honor and grace, position of peace and neutrality, maintenance of rule one, rule equal. If it's your volition to harm someone, if it's your volition to, to, to go after someone and make them pay, I can pretty much guarantee you that quantum grammar is not going to work for you. That's not what it's for. Quantum grammar is to stop trespass. It's to stop someone with malicious intent. If you want to hurt someone else or harm someone else in some way, shape, or form, this stuff is not going to be any type of benefit to you. Simply put, it just won't. Just as we had the big fight known as the Protestant Reformation over the translation of the Bible from Latin to modern languages, we would have the big fight over the translation of contracts into quantum and then another big fight over their proper translation back into non-quantum. Again, not true, more assumption presumption. And worst of all, it would be a big fight over interpreting and enforcing contracts, which are impossible and null and void by definition anyways, which she said at the beginning, 
So I don't even know why she's talking about this if all contracts are fraud in her eyes. Stop for five seconds and let the object craziness of all this sink in and let me repeat. All human contracts are void by nature. All human contracts. That's an interesting thing to say. What, why, why put the word human in there? Think about that, folks. Why? Because we don't have what it takes to make contracts, and neither do our human institutions and corporations, which have lifespans and limitations just like we do. <laughs> this is hilarious, folks. I know that Russell and David Wynn think of quantum as a way to overcome the Tower of Babel and reduce everything down to simple and irreducible terms. And that is a noble enterprise so far as it goes, but neither one seems to have the scientific background to know and truly understand how prone mathematics can be to manipulations and misinterpretation. Mathematics is just another language. It has the same flaws. Is it a better tool for making contracts than German or English or Peruvian? See, again, she betrays her astounding lack of knowledge about quantum grammar. Arguably so, but why are we engaged in doing something as dumb, as dishonest as making contracts in the first place? Once you give up assuming and believing that you can make contracts when you clearly can't, the whole underlying Miasma of lies and pain and purgatory and owing and usury collapses. That's so funny, man. I mean, because I'm looking, I look at uh, Anna Von Reitz's website and it's full of contract. It really is. She's literally a living, breathing contradiction. Let me check out the chat for a second. Hello, Galaxy 13 user. Hello, quadruple A. Thank you for the membership. Frank Collins had a lot of great info, but the system he believed in didn't honor itself and broke his heart. That's an interesting statement. If an inanimate object could break a man's heart, then how strong was the man's heart to begin with? That's wild. Let's get back to the, the paper here. Um, so as quantum is conceived as a better means of forming valid binding contracts, and as it is a literal impossibility to form valid binding contracts in the first place, let's just quit trying to do the impossible while we are ahead. This is like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This is like circular argumentation. This is ridiculous. This in and of itself is ridiculousness. Why is she even talking about this? And I, I would have to put her in the same category that I put Russell J. Gould or Mark Lowercase K, Kishon Christopher. I'd have to put her in the category of fiction system balderdash. Like whether she realizes or not, you know, she's promulgating the fiction system. She's a proponent of the system that she is supposedly fighting against. This is funny. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anna, that's contract. That is contract. Live in the moment of now because now is your only time and sure possession. Live now, love now, give to each other now. Neither store up riches upon earth nor speak of any future as a certainty. Again, that's contract. Even the great writs and great documents like the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> the no claration of no no pendants, and agreements like the Constitution for the United States of America are nothing more or less than expressions of will and good faith 
intention. So let us take our moral obligations to heart. The efforts of Russell and David are well meant, heroic, and well taken. The efforts of the men who have helped them too. But it is a fact that neither we nor our institutions are competent to make contracts. We can agree on things, contract. We can express our intentions, contract. We can testify as to our will, contract, but not make contracts. It may seem like a picky point to you, but I assure you it is not. It is the difference between truth and falsehood. Okay. That is all I need to hear from this individual's mouth because it's just a load of bullshit. Definitely, Anna Von Reitz, I put her in the same category, again, as I put Mark and Russell. I mean, they're all part of the fiction system in some way or another. A member who is writing in quantum grammar shorthand. So this ought to be juicy. I don't recognize the name. So apologies for that. But uh, I don't recognize the name. But let's see what we have here. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the cordial kindness with the comment of the great performance with the peace and with the neutrality of the volition with the correct sentence structure performance by the claimant, comma space, James Alexander. Oh. James? James, James, James. Two thumbs up, bro. That's a beautiful sentence. Perfect positional sequencing. No particles of negation in your facts. All your colons are in the correct place. If I had a hat, I'd take it off to you, bro. That's great. Great work. Uh, whoever you are, I don't know who you are. I don't think I, you've taken a workshop with me. So wherever you learned it, wherever you learned this, this to write like that man hats off to your teacher bro because that that's beautiful that's a beautiful sentence that really warms the <laughs> warms the cockles of my heart to see stuff like that in my chat is beautiful two thumbs up james kudos to you man i know you put some hard work in to, to get to that point so again well done you get a star you get an a plus you're on the honor roll, bro. Dennis Thompson says, hello, Jason. Yes, little history about Frank. He did a lot of good work. But the last time I seen him after church didn't honor itself. Frank said sorry to all, but said he was giving up. After church. What do you mean after church? Thank you, Jason. My name usually comes up as for the claimant. I am currently trying to read Fucanelli, Mystery of the Cathedrals, as recommended by yourself. Oh, good, good. Hope you enjoy it. Don't forget the uh, secret teachings of all ages. That's another one. Hello, brother. I'd be listening to you even without the grammar. Thanks. When translating fiction to correct sentence structure, how do you choose which word is the cause versus the concern? How do you choose which word is the cause versus concern? Well, it's credentialed in the grammar itself. Um, the grammar rules set out by Colin David Eiffel and Wink Colin Miller. The cause is F-O-R. The concern is O-F. So four, there are four positionals. Four of, with, and by. Four is the cause. Of is the concern. You give closure to that. One word, one meaning, one function, one congruency. 
meaning <laughs> four, the function of four is it is the cause of the sentence. Okay? The source of where the claim comes from. And the congruency of four is by, meaning four is congruent with by, of is congruent with with. When you read a sentence forwards, it's for the facts, of the facts, are with the facts, by the facts. Read it backwards. Well, actually, that's not a good example because let's let's uh, let's swap out those facts with something else. So, for the claim of the facts is with the knowledge by the claimant. You read that backwards. It's for the claimant of the knowledge is with the facts by the claim. Period. So when you read it forwards. For the claim, for is the cause. The claim is the cause. And then the authority is the claimant. And when you flip it, it becomes for the claimant. The claimant is now the cause. And then the claim at the end by the claim is the authority. Thanks, but it's not so clear from fiction grammar. Well, Rosvon, um, I'm not sure what you're after here. You're going to have to be a little bit more concise or clear with what you're asking. Do you mean it's not so clear with the words I'm using? Are the words I'm using not, are they muddy? Are they not clear enough for you? Is that what you mean? Because as I've stated in the past, you know, if you, if you, are from if you're from Mars and you only speak Martian and you come to Earth and you're confronted with English and you need someone to teach you English, um, do you think you're going to learn better studying a textbook in English, or are you going to learn better studying a textbook in English, which also translates to Martian? You have to use the native tongue or a, a trade medium tongue to convey or articulate the knowledge. You have to have a common ground. So to not use such a fantastical example, if I'm going to teach you English and you are Russian, it's better for me to know Russian and English. That way I can teach you English and use Russian too. It's very hard to learn English if you don't know English using only English. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's what I have to use to teach quantum grammar. I have to use plain, simple English to teach it. And again, keep in mind that correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar is a grammar. English is a language. English language can be used with quantum grammar, but it's not quantum language. It's not correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, language. It's grammar. There's a difference. I mean, if you translate a fictional phrase, it's not clear which word is the cause. Well, no, because it's fiction. Rosvon, so you got to, as I do in the mini classes and I've done in several live streams, and also I did in this, I don't know, I don't think you were in the seminar that I did. If you look at a, a sentence in the fiction, you kind of have to credential, what is the main idea, what is the main volition behind the sentence from your possession, uh, from your perception? I'll use one from, from a sentence I use in, in my very first workshop. Okay. And I know that you and I have done a workshop, Rosvon. I know that I donated to you a workshop. So I we've gone over this already. All right. You've done this exact thing. And I showed you how to do it. So I'm going to refresh your memory or I'm going to try to refresh your memory here. So the sentence is, my left leg hurts. What's the main idea of that? 
If you could boil it down to one word, what's being claimed in that sentence? My left leg hurts. What's the main idea or volition behind that sentence? Razvan, I'm not asking you what the cause is. I'm asking you what is the main idea of the sentence? What's being claimed in the sentence? What's the volition of the sentence? If you could sum it up in one word, what is it? What's the main idea summed up in one word of that sentence? Andrew, you are correct. You are 100% correct. So as I've stated, you guys are probably sick of me saying this. The best way for a beginner to start a sentence to get used to cause, concern, verb, possessive, concern, possessive authority, to get used to that sequencing, a very strong base to start with would be for the claimant's knowledge, which would be the cause, because the claim is coming from me as the claimant, my knowledge. That's the source of it. That's the cause of what I'm about to convey. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. If you start every sentence like that, you have a very strong foundation with which to proceed with the rest of the data. So now, as Andrew said, it's a claim of pain. And Rosvon says hurt. So there are lots of words you could use for that. So it's a claim of the, we'll say hurt, because I use the word hurt in there. But you could also use pain if you want to. Let's use them both. Pain and hurt. For the claim of knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the pain and hurt. Now what? Now you got to come into a possessive. What is possessing the pain and the hurt? Does anybody know? We have the cause, which is the claimant's knowledge. That's where the claim's coming from. And what's the claimant's knowledge concerned with? It's concerned with the facts. Now we put our verb of the thinking in. Singular is, which is the movement of the sentence, which we have for the claimant's knowledge of the facts, because you need two points with which to draw a straight line. So for the claimant's knowledge of the facts, whoop, you got your geometric level playing field of contract communication. Then you put your verb of the thinking in, which moves the cause and the concern into the possessive. The possessive is the claim. The claim is possessing the facts. What's the claim concerned with? The pain and the hurt. Now what comes next? What is possessing the pain and the hurt? I would say the pain and the hurt are the sensations, but that's not what's possessing the pain and the hurt. That is correct. So let's say this. With the tilde left hyphen leg what is why why do i put a tilde in front of the left hyphen leg does anyone know would anyone like to hazard a guess as to why i put a tilde in front of the left hyphen leg does anyone know Ramon, you are 100% correct. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. I think I know who you are, Ramon. If you are who I think, I mean, welcome anyways, but if you are who I think you are, say hello to your father for me. So you're 100% correct location. So I'm going to say of the location. Oh, Stefan. Salute, my friend. Welcome. So you're 100% correct of the location. Because left leg is a location. Now we can put in the sensation.
because it's me, I'm going to put my name in right there. So there you go. Here's your sentence. I'm going to I'm going to punch it in here. Here you go. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the pain and hurt with the left leg of the location with the sensation of the claimant, Jason. So Razvan, the cause of the sentence is the claimant's knowledge, right? That's where the claim comes from. And what's the claimant's knowledge concerned with? The facts. Now we have a verb of the thinking, moving the cause and the concern into the possessive with the claim. What is the claim concerned with? The pain and the hurt. What's possessing the pain and the hurt? The left leg. What is the left leg concerned with? It's a location. What's possessing that location? The sensation. And who is the authority of that sensation? I am, the claimant, Jason. Now, when you go backwards, it becomes for the claimant, Jason. I am the cause of the sentence. It's coming from me. I'm the source of it. What am I concerned with? A sensation. I'm conveying. It's a sensation. A claim of that. I'm, it's a conveyance of that. Not a claim of that, but a conveyance of a sensation. Again, singular verb is with the location. The location is possessing the sensation. What's the location concerned with? Of the left leg. What is possessing the left leg? With the pain and hurt. What's the pain and hurt concerned with? The claim, because it's a claim of pain and hurt. With the facts. The facts are possessing the claim because it is a claim of facts. And the authority of the facts is what? My knowledge, the claimant's knowledge. So it's by the claimant's knowledge. So there we go. I hope that answers your question. And again, Razvan, this is something we did in the very first workshop that I did with you a couple years ago. Uh, and this is also in my correct, if you look at my correct sentence structure playlist, I go over this from several different angles, how the cause is created in, this, in a correct sentence structure. And it's a, it's a, It's really a solid foundation to start your sentence with for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. So you have that foundation. What are you claiming? So if you're trying to translate a fiction babble sentence into correct sentence structure. You just have to identify what's being claimed here, like my left leg hurts. What is it a claim of? It's obvious. It's a claim of hurt or pain. Right. Um, another one you could say is uh, that I just used the other day. I see the sky is blue. What is that a claim of? I see the sky is blue. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the sight. It's a sight claim. I'm seeing something. I'm a seer. Yes, it's also could also be considered a witness claim if you want to go that way with it. Pretty much everything is uh, is a, comes from sensation, meaning your five plus senses, your port of sensation. How else are you able to collect data except through your senses? That's why I think the word sense and sensation is not in any Black's Law Dictionary. Because it's first-hand knowledge and it can't be argued. Fiction court is about arguing and opinion. When you start getting into the domain of sense and sensation, now you're getting into the domain of firsthand experience, and that can't be argued. So that's why I think it, they don't put it in Black's Law, and that's why you don't ever see it in court, which is exactly why I use it in my contracts. Because when there is a fact in place, 
there can be no argument. For the claimant's cognition of the sensation is, with this correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, claim of the facts with the knowledge by this claimant. Period. And by the way, Andrew, that uh, offer of the workshop stands and remains standing and uh, has no expiration date. Ooh, we have another sentence here. For the claimant's sensation of the shirt is with the color of the red with the channel mastered by this viewer. For this viewer of the channel master is with the red of the color with the shirt by the claimant's sensation. Okay, so the positional sequencing, Galaxy 13 user, great positional sequencing. Awesome sauce. Just a couple issues with what you're doing with the claim because it says claimant sensation, right? But I don't know who the claimant is. I see a viewer, but I don't know who the claimant is. It appears as though you may be making a claim for the channel master, which is a big no-no in correct sentence structure. You would not make a claim for anyone else. You would only make a claim for oneself. So we don't know who the claimant is. It's not clear if they're making a claim for someone else or making a claim for themselves. And I don't even know what the claim is because I see the word claimant, but I don't see the word claim anywhere. So I don't know what it is a claim of. What do you, What is it a claim of? That's why if you were listening for the last 10 minutes of this live stream, I suggested that beginners always start the sentence with for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. That way, you have a solid foundation. Now you can go into what you're going to claim. So in this sentence right here, it looks like it's a perception claim or a witness claim, as Ramon said earlier. So we'll just say witness. So we'll say, for the claimant's... Uh, for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the witness claim of the of the Jason's shirt with the color of the red with the sensation by this claimant and witness comma space galaxy 13 user. So something like that. Great info talk, Jason, don't bring facts into court, so, so true. Well, I hope my words are a little bit more clear than that, because what is a court? Like for me, a court can be a lot of things, but for the main part, it's a document contract, postal vessel, court venue, meaning the four corners of a document, my document is my court. And there are lots of facts on that court. So I have brought facts into the court. It's okay to bring facts into the court as long as you can certify them. So if you're going to bring them into a foreign vessel on dry dock, which would be the fiction court, of course you can bring facts in. You just have to be able to prove your facts. You have to be able to articulate closure of those facts to that court, to the people in that court. Of course, after first having voided all the boxes and planes. That's why you have to know correct sentence structure well enough that you can actually teach it to another individual, to a stranger under duress on the spot. Because if you can't do that, 
then you're not going to be able to convey closure of your facts. Then you're going to look like you're cuckoo. And then they're going to have an in to get you out of there. Meaning the most common way is that they'll say you're crazy because you're acting crazy because you don't know what the hell you're talking about. So you could be a threat to yourself and others. So then they can cuff you up and take you away. But if you know what you're talking about, if you have 100% closure on your facts and you can hold that position, that won't happen. Thank you, Razvan. I appreciate that. Much gratitude. Much gratitude to anyone on here, the members or anyone else who, who sends donations and gifts. Much appreciated. It all helps me to keep a roof over my head and put food on the table. And I, of course, I'm honored by anyone who finds this content valuable, valuable enough for them to actually return something to me for the value that I'm giving them. I appreciate it. Thank you. It is not forgotten on road. Have a good day, brother. You have a good day too, Andrew. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. The grammar is very valuable. I used to ask people that. I used to ask people, how much is this worth to you? You know, <laughs> because in essence, it's like a lot of people think that, oh, oh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Kofefe. Appreciate that. So if you, if you do find it valuable, if you say the grammar is very valuable and you find it valuable what I'm conveying, feel free to donate. Feel free to help keep this channel going. I appreciate it. And speaking of that, if for some reason, hold on a minute. Here we go. If it's not convenient for you to donate using YouTube and Super Chats and things like that, you can buy me a coffee over here on that link I just sent you right there. It's easy to do. And that platform, uh, buy me a coffee platform, I think they take like 5% of it. So I get the bulk of it. So I appreciate anybody who sends donations over there, which there have been a couple people that have sent some, some nice donations over there. I appreciate it. It definitely helps to keep me um, doing what I do to help you. So it's nice when you in turn help me and then it becomes a symbiotic relationship rather than just a give, 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 give relationship where the viewers just take, take, taking. So I just happen to have my blue folder here. Which nativity claims. So this is my grammar auditor document contract court authority claim. So this, because I don't use the word judge in my correct sentence structure contracts, because I feel like that's a word that it's sort of claimed by the fiction. And I don't really want a part of that. So I just use the word authority for myself, to credential myself, 
because I can prove that. I can prove that I'm an authority. So this is the claim for that. So the equivalent of this would be like an auditor in a, in a judge's oath, basically, would be the equivalent of this in the fiction. And then, of course, we got the fate writ volition claim. Port authority claim. Language tutor claim. Domicile contract. Live life claim, which this has its own little dictionary on there, by the way. And of course, I have my wife's claim. So those are the main claims that I carry around with myself. Razvan says, for this claimant of this volition is with the will of the grammar test with the curiosity of the grammar study level by the student's statement. All right, Razvan, so we have a couple issues here. Your positional sequencing is incorrect because every correct sentence structure must start with a cause and a concern, right? For the facts of the facts, for the facts of the fact. Doesn't matter if you're going forwards or backwards, for the facts of the facts. If you read your sentence backwards, by becomes for, so for the student's statement, of becomes with, with the grammar study level. So it's for the student's statement with the grammar study level, which is, <clears throat> it's incorrect. It can't be for the, the possessive never comes before the verb. It always comes after the verb. So when you read the sentence backwards, just like checking a math problem, you can tell where a mistake is. So your positional sequencing is incorrect. I see the word claimant right? But I don't see the word claim anywhere, so I don't know what you're claiming here. It's unclear to me what you are claiming. So that's why I say again and again and again, and I know you're probably all sick of me saying this, but I really don't grasp, you know, because I have said it four or five times here, why people don't start their sentences with for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. That way you cover all the bases when you're starting. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim. What are you claiming? You already have your base. What are you claiming? Now you can come in with your claim. So, Razvan, if you want to take a test, if you want to take the correct sentence structure test, uh, you can email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and apply for it. I'll give you the information on how to take the test. JasonMatthewG17 at gmail.com, and I'll mail you the details of how to proceed with taking the test. Actually, it's better and accurate to say authority over the word judge. A referee. A no furry, right? <laughs> RE means no. QQ is the music at the beginning of your video your own. Yes. Yes. I've been playing guitar since 1985. I play professionally in a band for four years at one point, but I've always been in bands for most of my life. Uh, I just recently got a beautiful... American Professional 2 Telecaster from Groom Guitars in Nashville, which I love Nashville, Tennessee, Music City. Um, and seeing probably the best guitar player I've ever seen in my life, Tom Bukovac, seeing his videos inspired me to, to learn more about the guitar. And so, yeah, that's me. Sh 
shoot, I always forget the last with the I will remember this. Well, yeah, I hope I hope you do. And uh, again, if you want to take the test, if you want to test your knowledge level, email me. Take that step. Right. Put your chest into it. Email me and I'll give you the details on how you can get the test and how we can do that. And again, if you have closure on the grammar, it will take you 10 to 15 minutes to complete the test. If it takes you any longer than that, you got a lot of studying to do, which looking at the sentence and the mechanics that you, you shared there, I would say workshops would probably be a better idea for you at this point. And again, you can email me and apply for a workshop. Will the test help you find the holes in my knowledge? You get that just from a phrase. I already see the holes in what you got there, Razvan. And that's not even to mention the syntaxing. I mean, I can put a sentence in and have you syntax it real quick. Um, I, I would, as far well, no, let's let's put it, let's see what your syntax is first. The test is kind of for those, number one, who are more advanced. And number two, see, I get either one of two types of people that apply for the test. One, that they're advanced and they're confident with their knowledge level. Or two, people that are beginners but think they're advanced. And they come on like all blustery and arrogant. And very quickly they find out that they didn't know what they thought they knew. Either which way, I mean, I, I can just test you right now with the syntax real quick to see where you're at. So let's, I'm going to put a sentence in here. There you go, Razvan. As you can see, I have taken the words out of the brackets. And so it is literally fiction babble. The man is not a family man, though he tries. Please syntax that sentence for me. I'm still looking at your syntax videos, adverb, adjective, pronoun, verb. I need to fully understand what you are doing, and then I can reproduce like a template. Uh, I mean, you, you can do what you want to do, but I strongly advise you not to plagiarize, and I strongly advise you not to try and use templates. I strongly advise you to create your own original documents. Maybe there was a time in the past when templates were uh, helpful and uh, people who used them were successful, but that time is long past. You definitely have to know what you're doing. And again, I highly recommend not plagiarizing. And I highly recommend creating your own grammatical documents rather than copying what someone else does. So as far as templates go, the only thing that, it, you know, ah, we'll leave it at that. So, Razvan, the man is not a family man, though he tries. You should be able to syntax that in 30 seconds. If you know, if you have closure on syntax, and you should be able to do that in 30 seconds. Are you still with us, Razvan? If you're still with us and you're still actively reading the chat. You should have long been done with this syntaxing. I mean, if you have closure on syntaxing. Sorry, I'm on a phone and the video is delayed somehow. I got chat answers before the question. I'm not sure what that means, Razvan. Are you 
Are you syntaxing the sentence or, or what? I asked you to syntax the sentence. The man is not a family man, though he tries. Uh, will you please syntax that for me? Um, I'll just wait for you to complete that, and then I got to end this. But I'm, I'm waiting for you to complete that. If you could do that, please. Just put your syntax values in there, bank them in there, and uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah, Andrew, I wonder, I wonder how far delayed is it? That's crazy. What? Let me see. When did I first put the sentence in? Uh, I can't see the timestamp. It had to have been at least 10 minutes ago, so he had to have seen it. Am I right? So, Razwan, I guess I'll just, you know, I'd have to say that you're probably about 50 to 60 percent on a scale of zero to 100. So, definitely, workshops would definitely uh, benefit you. But the most important thing, my friend, is to study consistently every single day. Because I, as I say, you know, it's like walking up a down escalator. If you're doing anything except for walking forward, putting one foot in front of the other, you're going backwards. And I mean, you, you've been at this for a couple of years, three years, maybe, right? And what I see in your sentence there, you know, always missing that possessive before the authority. To me, it comes from just not practicing. Because for me, like uh, I started studying in 2017, the summer of 2017, by February of 2018, I was teaching. I was giving workshops and stuff. Because um, I did it every, every, every single day. I was like totally dedicated to it. So that's kind of like the mindset you perhaps would want to cultivate my friend is to just be really, really committed to it and at least do 30 to 60 minutes a day of something to do with quantum grammar. You know, I think it would help tremendously. Does anyone else want to take a shot at syntaxing that sentence? The man is not a family man, though he tries, period. Anybody else out there want to try and syntax that? Yeah, that is crazy, Rosvon. I don't see any numbers. What I'd recommend is to copy and paste the sentence into the chat and then put the numbers in next to the words. It would be the easiest way for me to be able to see what it is you're doing rather than just type out a bunch of numbers. And then I have to, you know, try and fit those into the words. That's just the way I would do it. So does anybody else want to take a shot at syntax and galaxy 13 user? Would you like to take a shot at it? Uh, I would have to ask Stefan not to take a shot at it because Stefan is quite advanced and I know he'll probably uh, he'll probably get it in the first shot. Andrew, I'm not sure where you're at. Matter of fact, I have no idea where you're at with it, but you're more than welcome to try. All right, Galaxy 13 user, I will let you try. This should be interesting. And anybody else lurking out there that wants to try, go ahead and give it your best shot. I encourage you to.
And if any of you feel the least bit tentative or nervous about putting yourself out there, if, if being in this live stream in the chat makes you feel uncomfortable or nervous, what do you think is going to happen if you have to try and use this stuff in an under duress situation out in the public? <laughs> this is nothing compared to what can happen out there. I think this is the longest live stream I've ever done. The man is not a family man, though he tries. All right, Razvan, uh, just based upon that, I will say that I was correct in assessing that you're about 50 to 60% there with your knowledge level because... Man is not a verb. Is is not an adverb. Uh, I'm not sure why you would put an adverb next to an adverb because adverbs modify adjectives and adverbs modify verbs, but they would not modify each other. Like an adverb would not modify another adverb the way an adjective could modify another adjective. And the reason is, is because adverbs are non-tangible. There's nothing there. There's not enough substance there for it to hold modification of another adverb. And if you go to my parts of speech playlist and look at that adverb video, I explain it in depth as to why adverb would not modify another adverb. So I see one, two, three, four, five. I see five mistakes in your syntax. So that's half the sentence. So you got a 50% on that test. <laughs> but I mean, don't take it as a, a negative thing. I mean, take it as a motivation to commit to doing workshops and learning this stuff and getting closure on it. After three years, I mean, the best time to learn is now. Let's get it done, right? Get on it. All right. So I'm not going to give the answer right now. But what I am going to Ooh. Hold on. The man. James. One, oh wow, okay, so what is this one, two, three, four scenario, James? Because I, uh, the five syntax scenarios you got one, two, you got three, four, you got four, one, two, you got four, one, three, four. Right? Wait. You got one, two, four, one, two, three, four, one, three, four, and four, one, three, four. Where is there a one, two, three, four scenario? Oh, he retracted the message. You didn't have to do that, man, because. When this is replayed back, people are going to watch it and they could have learned from that mistake. 
and correcting it, but you retracted it. So now people are never going to (laughs) know. So I'm just going to give the answer. The is an adverb modifying man into an adjective, which is coloring is into an adjective which is coloring not into a pronoun. Nothing can follow a pronoun except for breaking the continuance of the evidence or, in this case, an adverb, which A is an adverb, modifying family into an adjective. Man is an adjective, though is non-tangible contract pronoun. And again, same thing. Nothing can follow a pronoun except for breaking the continuance of the evidence. And we have he, which is non-tangible contract adverb, modifying tries into a dangling participle verb. So you can compare your sentence with my sentence, Razvan. Is is tangible contract, so it would not be syntax as an adverb. He is non-tangible contract. It would not be syntax as an adjective because tangible contract words would never be adverbs. Non-tangible contract words would never be pronouns. Or I'm sorry, would never be adjectives. So he is non-tangible. Is is tangible. Verbs can be either tangible or non-tangible, and pronouns can be either tangible or non-tangible. Sentences would always either end on fours or twos. A sentence would never begin with the two in the fiction, because in order for a verb to exist in the fiction, it has to be modified by an adverb. So there's your answer. And that's my assessment, Razvan. I'd say you definitely need a deep dive into workshops because you're about 50, 50% there, man, 50 to 60. I'll give you 60 on based on your correct sentence structure, but your syntaxing, there's a lot of holes there. And you got to know them both equally because if you're going to tell someone they're using a fictitious conveyance of grammar and you're going to tell them that they're using incorrect grammar, then you damn well better know how to write correct grammar well enough to teach them why their grammar is wrong. That's rule one, rule equal. I appreciate you taking part in this. I appreciate you putting yourself out there like that. And, uh, Hopefully, this has helped you on your journey, and I do hope to uh, see you apply for a workshop and get some closure on this stuff. Because, I mean, what what is your – I mean, you got to kind of think of what your volition is. I mean, if this is just like a fun pastime to do – that you come on here, that's cool. That's cool, man. You know, if this is where you get your learning in. Yes, Razvan is as tangible. Have you ever parsed it? If you parse the word, and this, this is the rule for credentialing tangibility and non-tangibility, is you look it up in an etymology dictionary and you go to the earliest nativity root meaning of the word. You follow the continuance of the evidence to the earliest nativity root meaning of the word. So it sounds like you either haven't looked it up or you have not gone back to the earliest nativity root meaning of the word. That's what it sounds like. Because that's usually the case. When people are surprised that is is tangible. It just means they haven't looked it up or they haven't done enough research on it. But it's all available to the public if you go to Etymology Online. For the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the man, with the family of the lack 
with the family unit sentiment by this claimant. <laughs> That's great uh, positional sequencing there. However, I see a particle of negation in your facts with the vowel in front of a consonant in the unit. Now, keep in mind, um, correct sentence structure. Now, I understand the sentiment behind what you're doing there, but I never use uh, correct sentence structure. I try not to use it, you know, in, in a joking manner because it's sacred to me. And so what it looks like to me is a Galaxy 13 user is claiming that they're not a family man. <laughs> which i mean that's cool but it looked like at the beginning that they were claiming a gender because it says for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the man man is a gender right so that's what it, that's what i thought he was doing or her his her him i i don't know what your gender is there But that's what it looked like you were doing. But that's not at all what you were doing. Uh, what it looks like, like if you would say, to go in the direction you were going with it, just for knowledge cultivation's sake, if you're trying to translate that sentence, which is a, a goofy-ass sentence to try and translate, I would never translate that into a correct sentence structure. I would never use something like that in a correct sentence structure. I stay away from negative statements. Although sometimes you do have to make a negative statement as I convey in the uh, don't touch me video. It looks like the claim would be a perception claim because if you're not the man who's lacking the sentiment, if you, you're witnessing it, you're, maybe you're witnessing someone else lacking the sentiment. So it would be for the claim to knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the witness with the sentiment lack of the man with the joinder of the family with the perception by this claimant and witness Galaxy 13 user, something like that, you know, just roughly off the top of my head. Like I said, I will sign up for a workshop. <laughs> Bro, if, if I had a troy ounce of gold for every time I heard someone say that, I wouldn't be here right now. I don't want to jinx you or anything, but every time someone says that, it never happens. Let's see if you're the exception. Yes, it is challenging, and it's fun. That's why I've been here for two hours with you guys doing this. So, Razvan, you are surprised that is is, is tangible, yet you haven't looked it up. So, do you see? You, you are assuming that it's non-tangible. And what's the main thing that we don't do with correct sentence structure? We never assume things. We always look things up. We always get closure. We always have a continuance of the evidence for what we're claiming. So if you're claiming that is is non-tangible, you have to prove that. And most times I'll ask somebody, why is is non-tangible? Why, why do you think it's non-tangible? And then someone will say, well, I can't hold an is in my hand. Well, love is tangible. You can't hold love in your hand, but love is tangible, right? So, I mean, that doesn't... Although physicality of, a, of an object is an indicator of tangibility, it's not the be-all, end-all of it. So again, it's looking it up in the etymology dictionary and going to the earliest nativity root meaning. If that's tangible, then you syntax the word as tangible. If it's not, you syntax it as non-tangible. 
It's that simple, folks. Thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. All the people that participated, Galaxy 13 user, Razvan, Stefan, Andrew, all you folks that had the cojones to step forward and participate, I appreciate it. For all you lurkers and silent viewers out there, I also appreciate you. I appreciate the gifts that were sent to me. I mean, that means a lot to me because it tells me that people value what I do and it keeps me coming back. Thank you very much and peace. If you would like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, I offer several choices. The first one and the easiest one is to study the almost 900 free public videos on this YouTube channel that you're watching right now. The second option, if you want to see new content, is to click the join button on my main YouTube page or under any video that you're watching. Click the join button and you will see two tiers of membership. If you choose the second tier, the loyalist contributor tier, and you join that for a monthly support donation, you'll get new content, fresh content exclusive content not available to the public every month but keep in mind there's already almost 900 videos here free to the public to study and the third option is to contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen and this is for the serious students only and apply for a correct grammar workshop but please include your correct name when contacting me and I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation and you and I will have a conversation you can ask me whatever you want I'll answer your questions. I'll do the same with you. I'll ask you questions and we'll see if indeed you are really serious or not. Thank you.